Come back into session. Thank you again for giving us some grace, uh, get a chance to get away and to be able to uh, do the votes and then to be able to come back in. Uh, we have heard your testimony and received that. Obviously, I have your written testimony as well. Uh, we are going to get a chance to discuss some things with questions. Feel free to be able to just interact with us and, uh, and let us just start running through those things as we can at that point. Uh, Mr. Shaw, let me, let me start with you on something. You had made a comment that I thought was very interesting about uh, fact-based cases, that you're not waiting for an indictment somewhere through DOJ. You're doing your own fact-based ca fact cases. Two questions with that. One, if you could elaborate more on the process that you do with that. And the second one is, what, what kind of due process protections do you have in place to protect your contractors to make sure that, you know, as you're doing your own fact-based research here, that you don't also have a contractor that's out there that's getting stung inappropriately. So how do you balance the two of those? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, it's a matter of looking at the evidence and not just relying entirely upon the fact of an indictment or a, or a conviction. In the FAR, it says an indictment or conviction is sufficient as a matter of law. So a lot of agencies then use that as a security They're benefit. just exclusive to that. You're going yeah. Into yeah. the details, and it's it, right. So we look at the evidence, and if the evidence meets the preponderance of the evidence standard of a debarment or an adequate evidence standard of a suspension, then we will do the action. Uh, and probably half of our cases are that way, maybe more than half. And, and I think that's a significant difference in why we have so so many more numbers or higher. Numbers. Do you feel like the contractors are still protected in the process as well? Yes, there, there's actually a, there is there's a lot of procedures. They have the right to come in in 30 day, within 30 days and meet with us personally. Or if there's a genuine dispute of material fact, mm -hmm. then they have a right to a mini trial, a fact finding proceeding right. where under oath, cross examination of witnesses, uh, that that type of proceeding. Right, and that's Mr. Very, so that's what that's what you were talking about. Basically, this mini trial that y'all do with EPA as well. Uh, yes, sir. If, if there is a dispute of a genuine material fact, then we likewise will have a uh, what a, we call a mini trial. We actually just call it a fact finding hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shaw, you had mentioned as well that you are outside of the procurement chain and you felt like that was better mm -hmm. uh, on that. Is anyone else in that same situation for your agency where you're outside the chain? Mr. Peltier? Uh, yes, sir. We're not in the, in the acquisition chain. Right. We are within the grants uh, office, but we're, it's a grants and debarment, so it's geared towards both. And it's not strictly within the the purview of those that award the money, and that's what really the uh, thing that I think we're aiming. So separate, Dr. Nyack, Ms. Gunderson. Yeah. So in our new program, the uh, suspension barman official, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because his family right. is gravely ill, um, will be outside of the procurement chain. Okay, Ms. Gunderson. I provide oversight over our procurement function, um, but I'm not directly responsible for the operations, the actual con awarding of contracts. It's in the same grants. office, same group at that point? Right. Okay. Uh, but you, say it to me again, the first thing you said on so it. So I provide a functional oversight over our acquisition function, but my office is not directly responsible for the award or the administration of grants and contracts. Okay. So we're independent from that function. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Belcher, tell me a little bit about on the uh, EPA uh, section of it. There's um, the list, the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, obviously those exclusions that are that are there. Um, you had mentioned a four to one ratio of non procurement and procurement. Tell me, explain that to me again. Wait. Well, the amount of money that the EPA awards and the procurement side, it's not as much. It's nearly four times as much in the non procurement and the grants and interagencies agreements and things of that nature. The way it works, of course, is that we simply will we'll make a grant to a state that then awards contracts. We keep a watch on those situations, and if there's still some reason to debar somebody that has been receiving our money, whether it's by grant, uh, through a contract with a state, we still would take action against okay. them. But if you have somebody that has violated Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, they're going on the list at that point. That's correct. Uh, regardless of contract, is that just an automatic, it's discovered, this person's violated the Clean Water Act? You, you don't even know if they do federal contracts. They just automatically go onto the exclusions list as well? Yes, sir. That is the, that is the mandate of the statute. And the way that goes is that they uh, we are notified of a conviction under certain provisions within the Clean Water, Clean Air Act. Then we must put them on the list if they meet the three criteria, which is they, in fact, uh, you know, were convicted and the limitation, because the statutories under the Clean Air and Clean Water Act are limited debarments. It's only if they're going to perform a contract at the violating facility and they own, lease, or control that facility. To get off the list, 
they must submit information to the EPA, uh, which we call a, a reinstatement request, and then it is somewhat like a reverse debarment. At that point, then, we hear the evidence and determine if they have uh, they must I have to certify that they have, in fact, cured all the violations that put them on the list in the first place. Okay. So there is a process to be able to get out, but, they, but the company has to initiate. You all just leave them on the list until the company or entity initiates a request to get off the list. That is correct, sir. Okay. Um, let me talk a little about uh, HHS, obviously. Uh, it is obvious it has come up multiple times. There have been some issues there in, in the process on it. The, uh, I'm glad you are here, glad to be able to go through the process. The, the challenge of it is from your testimony. Uh, two different times you said the word, we intend to accomplish this, and one other time you mentioned we are in discussion about this. My only concern about that is I, I need to know when, uh, because obviously this, this has come up for a while. This is a serious issue. You all have been very active in pursuing fraud in other areas uh, to be able to get this into place. So what I would like to request of HHS is that you get back to this committee when those things are going to be resolved, when the final process is, is complete so we can have who the individuals are that have been re reassigned to oversee that and what their basic process is, these three factors that GAO discussed earlier, and the actual person that is overseeing that, whether that is you or someone else, so we will know who is the responsible party for that. Uh, that would be very helpful to be able to get back to us. So basically, when this is going to get accomplished and who the person is that is going to be responsible for overseeing it, we have got to find a way to move from we intend to get this done to this is actually done. So do you want to respond to that? or No, thank you for that opportunity, and we would be happy to get back to you on, on our timelines and our specific plans. Yeah, because we uh, obviously you know there is an issue. It came up. You, you, mm -hmm. I'm sure, interacted in the process and, and received did you receive a, a draft of the GAO report before it was all complete? Yes, we had received a draft. Before. Okay, so had time to be able to interact, and so obviously mm -hmm. had time to prepare on this. Uh, our staff did a quick search, just a Google search, uh, for looking for fraud, for instance, in NIH. There are a couple of hits that came up immediately. Department of Justice press releases, Temple Hills, Maryland, man sentenced for bribing and uh, a purchasing offer to get business for his computer company. And then another one, Hyattsville project manager pleads guilty to fraudulent obtaining money under oath with an NIH contract. We then went to EPLS and they were not listed. So we still have some of the same issues, obviously. I am not asking you to be aware of every single contract, every single case, but just in a quick search of possible contracts that may be out there, are they getting on EPLS yet? Obviously, they are still not. And so we, we, we've got to move from intends to, to get it. I just ask you to be able to get that report to us as quick as we can so we can know this is covered. You are very aware, as everyone else is, uh, as well as FEMA and, and every other agency looking at it. It helps the entire Federal Government avoid getting into a bad contracting situation when we know one entity has done a bad contract, they have been debarred, every other contract officer can then look at that as well. So with that, I appreciate that, and I yield my time to Mr. Kelly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nyack, or Dr. Nyack, and my concern is DHS, and it has to do with Katrina. GEO found that DHS had 116 suspensions or just or debarments related to the Federal procurement from 2006 to 2010, yet there were no FEMA actions. Now, as you know, DOJ has an, an entire task force dedicated to the Hurricane Katrina fraud. They have convicted numerous individuals of false statements and fraud in connection with FEMA disaster relief assistance. And according to the 5th anniversary report of the Attorney General, one of the principal types of fraud on which the task force concentrates is government contract and procurement fraud. Can you explain why FEMA has not taken action against any party indicted, convicted, or found to have engaged in Katrina-related fraud? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I've, I've been at DHS for a little bit less than a year, so I don't know how effective I'll be at uh, sharing what I know about Katrina, but I, I can share some things that FEMA is doing uh, and some pos positive momentum that they're gaining, as well as share with you what we're doing at the departmental level that will affect everybody in DHS, including FEMA. Uh, so the information that uh, is probably most relevant is just there is some positive momentum in FEMA around suspension and debarment. They actually have five individuals dedicated to doing this now. Uh, in this fiscal year itself, there were 19 referrals, um, 15, uh, sorry, 19 investigations, 15 referrals, five suspensions, five uh, debarments of either grantees or contractors. So there is some positive momentum. And then again, uh, coming back to what we're doing at a departmental level, which is essentially following all the best practice that's been shared here. And then uh, to add on to uh, what Chairman Lankford just uh, mentioned, we should be done and have this up and running in the next three months or so. 
going back to uh, the Katrina days, one of the nice things about putting this program in place at the departmental level is it, it will be able to, and the suspension department official will be able to go back and look at uh, any actions uh, that, that occurred during that time frame. So uh, we have got a program that will follow best practice, and uh, we will report out on that uh, over time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I to follow up on that as well. Dr. Nyack, is it, is it possible when that is complete as well, your process, you said it will be done in the next three months of getting everything, that Joe would also submit that back to this committee just so we could have that as a record as well? Very pleased to do it. That would be terrific. Let, let me start a second round. If you want to be able to jump in on the second round of questions, you can, but um, I'm going to give a moment for Mr. Connolly to be able to come and, and ask questions in a moment as well. Uh, Mr. Shaw, we, we've talked a little bit about legislative fixes, and GAO earlier mentioned it really feels like the legislation that's needed is already in place. There's no additional legislation needed. I'd like to ask your opinion on that statement. Is there additional legislation that you would see or that any of you, and you can also think about this as well, that you would see, this would provide greater assistance to the agencies and clarification? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't see any legislation directly, narrowly dealing with suspension and debarment, but I do have thoughts in two areas on related areas okay. that could help Please suspension share. department. One is the Program Fraud Civil Remedies Act, which I know your committee is familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, which was passed in 1986, uh, but has not been used because it's so cumbersome, frankly. The <laughs> Defense Department is working on it. That's a shock that there's a federal <laughs> instance that's cumbersome. So that we're, we're working on a, a, a we expect that uh, the Defense Department will be having that a proposal for a fix for that that would okay. also have the suspending and debarring officials being the people that would enter the penalties under that. So that would relates to debarment. It gives greater visibility into other cases for debarment officials. It's sort of an automatic referral process. The second area uh, that would stir up uh, referrals from the contracting community particularly would be the use of proceeds from litigation uh, that relates to procurement fraud. If, there, if the proceeds or some portion of the proceeds uh, could go to the program that's victimized by the fraud and not just to the U.S. Treasury, then the agencies would be able to fix the widget that was, you know, broken by the uh, fraudulent contractor without taking it out of O&M funds, and that would encourage the contracting community to be more interested and in, in proactive in this area. So run that through me again where you see the process. You're saying when they are found to be fraudulent, the recovery of that money from fraudulent is currently not going back into the agency? That That's right. It, it, if the program, if there's if Smith Company is convicted or there's a civil judgment for False Claims Act against a hypothetical Smith Company, and for having damaged a program, the KC-10 Air Force program, uh, that money, millions of dollars often cases in that situation, if the procurement money is closed, if, if, which is always the case in these situations because it takes a long time to investigate these things. So the bad guy is being ordered to refund the money, but the money does not go to the program that is being victimized. It doesn't go to Tinker. It doesn't go to Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center. Well, I would, I would think all of it needs to go to Tinker yeah. or Oklahoma City on that. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that would be helpful. Okay. That is very helpful to know. Um, Mr. Connolly brought up an issue on the contingency uh, contracting. Wartime situation, obviously, contracts are going very rapid. A lot of new contractors going in. If you are dealing with Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of uh, foreign contractors are also getting engaged on the ground. How are we handling the issues of debarments and suspensions in a contingency operation? There is a memorandum of understanding within the Defense Department where the Army is the lead agency, the administrative agency for departments and suspensions uh, and for contracting, actually, contracting as a whole. Okay. Uh, so I hate to duck that question. We have done. It is an Army question. Yeah. The Air Force has done a lot of, uh, a number of departments and suspensions from the theater, but the great majority of them are Army ones. Okay. We will try to follow up with that as well, mm -hmm. uh, because that obviously is important to us and a lot that is happening. Um, just a moment. Mr. Peltzer, tell me a little bit about the um, appeal process that you have going. You, you discussed this in your testimony earlier about your appeal. When someone has a protest, say they've been debarred, you talked about the mini trial uh, type situation coming in an appeal. Has that been effective or is that so cumbersome 
Uh, let, me, let me say it this way. We don't want anything to stand in the way of saying if there is a good process for suspension and debarment, we don't want someone to say, I don't want to go through that because it is so cumbersome and it is so bulky, I would rather not even go through it than to actually do it. Well, so I am uh, looking for how does that work for you all? Yes, sir. It is actually easy uh, in this respect. The appeal process that we have built in at the EPA is that I make a final decision to debar somebody uh, or a decision to maintain a suspension. They have the right to appeal to the director of the division. It is a very easy process. They simply uh, present whatever evidence they think why it should not be in place. And then the director has the opportunity to remand the case to me or uphold it. And if it is remanded to me, then I can review what was, why it was remanded and have a second opinion or dismiss it, depending on what the circumstances are. And then subsequently, of course, they have the right under the Administrative Procedure Act to go to a district court. But it does give the, actually, what is easy about it, it gives the respondent, rather than the choice of immediately incurring court costs and going and hiring attorneys and doing everything that is involved, they can make a, an appeal within the system. And they do get a second look. Okay. How long does that take? I mean, before you get into Administrative Procedures Act and actually go into an outside court, total process on that, give me an average. The internal one? Or yes, internal. Internal is usually within three months. It has been up and back and a final decision again. Okay. So whole process, three months, done. Yes, sir. That is fairly rapid for us. Yes, sir. Okay. You also mentioned you have 42 cases, and I want to see if I get this number correct, that you felt were, were statutory. Uh, exclusions. Was that from last year, you are saying? You, that's, you, go ahead. Sir, that is the preliminary number we have for FY 2011. Okay. You know, it is a preliminary number. Now, that, th those are individuals that have been excluded because of Clean Water Act violations, Clean Air Act violations, a total of 42. Is that nationwide? Yes, sir. Okay. That number is actually lower than I anticipated. There is a reason I ask and come back to it as well. So that would be that's not necessarily contractors that are just individuals that have been found in violation of the Clean Water, Clean Air Act and have been listed out and saying if they ever apply for a contract, there is an exclusion in this area, this plant, this location. That's correct. Okay. Terrific. With that, I yield to Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to be a little late getting back. I had a meeting. Um, Ms. Gunderson, you heard the testimony of the uh, GAO representative, Mr. Woods who noted that uh, when it came to procurement, there has not been a single suspension or debarment by HHS in five years. How, what is the value of the total procurement in that time period? The total value in that time frame was about $81 billion. Um, in the last two years, we have done around $19 billion annually. Okay. Can you help enlighten us on why there would not be a single suspension or debarment? I mean, all the contracts are just that good. We do take contractor oversight um, very seriously, uh, including the way in which we select and, and evaluate our contractors prior to award and the way we administer those contracts during performance. We have had contractor performance issues that we have used other tools and flexibilities on, such as terminations for default. And we do see suspension and debarment as a tool um, in our toolbox, per se, to, uh, to manage concerns. But, but none of the issues we have had have risen to that level. Right. And, and, and presumably you shared that, that view with the GAO when they were looking at this issue in your agency. Yes, we did in our meeting. What was their response to that? Um, their response was very, it was generally acknowledging um, our premise. Um, and we were delighted to see the recommendations around the three characteristics of the more active agencies and are taking those into um, consideration for developing our plans around improving policies and our referral practices and dedicating staff to the effort. Would it be fair for a layman to conclude that the priority within HHS is Medicare? It would be fair to um, conclude that. The Secretary has come strongly um, down on all areas of program integrity, though. Um, program integrity um, is one of her key strategic initiatives, as well as encompassed in our strategic plan. Um, Mr. Shaw pointed out that uh, there are only three Federal agencies, I believe, that have, like the Air Force, a full-time dedicated debar debarment officer. Uh, can we expect that HHS, given the huge volume you are talking about, even though Apparently, in the $81 billion of the last five years, nothing rose to this level. 
would it make sense from your point of view, from the agency's point of view, to emulate the Air Force and have a full-time uh, officer with respect to this set of issues? That is one of the models we are looking at, among all the others that are out across the Federal agencies. Um, I, I do serve as a suspension and debarment official because I have oversight over the acquisition and grants policies and the operations of those um, functions. So currently, as it stands, it makes the most sense to fit it within my organization. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, we are looking at other models um, uh, that other agencies have had. When might this committee know when you have you've finished looking at and have decided upon yeah. A plan of action. Yeah, the chairman has asked us to get back to the committee on that, um, and we will be doing that. With Do you have a timeline, however? Um, generally speaking, we're looking within the next three months of okay. implementing these policies and 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 a new plan. Uh, thank you, and Mr. Nyack, you also outlined. Oops, am I over my time? No, you go right ahead. Um, uh, you also outlined. Basically, if I heard you correctly, and you are very succinct and concise testimony, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that um, you were going to essentially and trying pretty much the recommendations of the GAO and get on with it. What is your timeline for doing that? Yeah, and I also mentioned to the Chairman three months. Three months. By the end of the calendar year. It was such a good an answer, I just wanted to get it in the record a second time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, it would be a terrific Christmas present to us. We will be able to read it over New Year's. So I appreciate that. With that, I recognize Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for, from all of you, just your opinion on the mandatory, mandatory debarments. Mr. Shaw, maybe you would start and just kind of walk me through what, what you all think. Thank you, uh, uh, Congressman. Uh, I, th I think that mandatory debarments are a bad idea in the procurement area. Uh, they, I'm not familiar enough with the Clean Water Act and all those that may work with regard to facilities, but in the procurement area, it takes away an important tool that we have to fight fraud, and that tool is the leverage that we can use with this carrot and stick that I mentioned before about working with contractors that are trying to do it right and to changing their conduct and improving their processes so that they have risk management programs in place where the fraud won't happen in the first place. If there is a mandatory debarment, companies are going to tend to think, well, why bother? And they are just going to obfuscate and fight the investigations and rather than work proactively to avoid the fraud in the first place. So, so uh, And there is a lot of good, I think, we do in that area, both when there is misconduct with such things as administrative agreements, but also where there is no misconduct at all. We meet regularly with all of the major defense contractors to talk about their ethics programs, even when they are not in trouble. So I, I oppose it. Okay. Mr. Bill here. Sir, thank you. I, I agree in the sense that the mandatory statutory debarments take away the key element of discretion. Like the Air Force, I am a full-time suspension debarment official. Uh, each agency has its own particular interests and in information that or uh, situation that it has to deal with. Allowing the suspension debarment official to have that discretion as it deals with a contractor that may be versus someone that is bad, someone that's defrauded the government, somebody that's made a mistake, somebody that doesn't realize how the situ how the federal process works, but is quite willing to change and adjust. We may have potentially a very good contractor or a very good grants uh, person available to us. We don't want to throw them out the window without a chance of getting back in the game. So with the discretion that the suspension department official has, we can do things like inter-administrative agreements, which are basically commercial probation, if you will. Uh, we, we have a very strict set of requirements that they have to meet. We monitor that. They report back. And a violation of an administrative agreement, for example, is another grounds for debarment. Uh, and at the end of the process, and it's usually three years, we more, far more often than not end up with a better contractor, a better grants, uh, or what we call a participant, uh, than we started off with. And I think the best interest of the government has been protected. Okay. Dr. Nyack. And, and so I'm not as much of an expert <clears throat> as these gentlemen, but uh, I would agree with them 100 percent where it comes to contractors. And then statutorily, I'm just not that much of an expert to sort of give you a read on that, but happy to you know, look into it with the committee. If you could, that'd be great. Thank you, Ms. Gunnarsson. HHS does use the mandatory exclusions on the healthcare um, side. Um, that's not handled specifically by my office. It's an authority under our office of the Inspector General, but is a valu valuable tool that the department uses to combat healthcare fraud, um, patient neglect, and those sorts of issues that rise to mandatory exclusions. Okay, good. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chair. I'd like to yield a couple minutes, Mr. Connolly. Just to follow up, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Pelletier, uh, it strikes me 
based on our analysis, in terms of per billion dollars of contract dollars, you have a much higher debarment and suspension rate than does DOD. Uh, you would agree? Uh, notwithstanding Mr. Shaw's opinion to the contrary, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, so here, but my question is this. Um, to what do you attribute that? We have a situation where DOD per billion dollars of contract has a much lower rate than you do. Uh, HHS and procurement has zero rate because, according to Ms. Gunderson, they have used other mechanisms. Um, you know, if you are a member of Congress listening to this, you are thinking there seems to be a wide variety of judgment being exercised, and that may be a good thing, but it is uh, hard to get our arms around in terms of predictability and accountability for the taxpayers we represent. I just want to give you the opportunity to comment on your own observation of why this variability among agencies and why does EPA uh, apparently use this tool more frequently than some other agencies? Well, first of all, sir, I couldn't obviously comment on to the why other agencies are or are not doing something or how their program works. Each one is unique. But on, as I said in my statement, EPA is really the pioneer in this area. We started in 1981 uh, developing a program. And over the years, it, it, as anything else, we developed an expertise in the area. And perhaps and one of the things in teaching, uh, which we are very active in the uh, National Suspension Environment Training Program, one of the feedbacks we get from people that are in the class is, we didn't realize it was that easy to do. So it may be that we have developed an expertise because of longevity that affords us a, a, a greased rail uh, where we know how to do it because we have done it so many times. And, and do you have a uh, dedicated full-time, as, as Mr. Shaw is, for the Air Force? Yes, sir. I am the full-time. You are it. I, I am it. Uh, and our staff at the division, are, that is their job. Uh, we have seven attorneys on that, two investigators, an auditor, two in, uh, and a support personnel, and a di uh, division director. Yeah. That is all we do is suspension department. And, and just final question. I assume, like, and Mr. Shaw, you are free to answer as well, but I think you already testified to this. Mr. Shaw pretty much said having at that full-time dedicated person makes sort of all the difference in making sure you have an active program. Would you concur? It's worked well for, for our agency. Uh, we have a senior person uh, and we have a dedicated person and it's proven to be very, very effective. Thank you very much. Let's close out the hearing, but I want to give an opportunity for any of the four witnesses to make any final comments that you would like to be able to get in on the record as well or a response to anything. Well, I, I guess I sure. have, Thank you. Mr. Sure. Chair. I guess I just a couple of observations. I have never done an analysis. It is interesting. Your mathematics is, is correct on the per dollar. But I am wondering whether, well, first of all, let me say I think that the number of debarments is a bad metric anyway for this whole program, for this whole process. But it is an easy one because the numbers are what the numbers are. So it's important, and everybody at the end of the year always compares numbers. You know what, what you're doing proactively to prevent fraud and to encourage improvement in the culture of companies and things. I, th I think is much more important. But having said that, even looking at the numbers metrics, I think the better way of looking at it would be not the number of debarments and suspensions per contract dollar, but maybe the number per contracts. And I don't know how you would get at that number, but a big difference in DoD from EPA and. ICE and other agencies is we deal with big dollar contracts. So, for example, when I suspended Boeing several years ago on a $15 billion space launch program, I mean, that, that, was, that counted, I guess, three. So I had three suspensions, but it was a $15 billion contract. I mean, all of the Air Force and defense contracts are big dollar amounts. So I, I think that maybe skews a little bit, that point oh nine thing. Sure. Any other comments from any other witnesses? We do appreciate your attendance, the work to be able to come and to be able to be here. Your written statements, obviously, uh, probably the least favorite part of your week was to be able to come and do a congressional hearing. So we do appreciate the time for you to be able to be here. And uh, with that, this committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.